Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining today's event. Uh, our team has prepared a document for future media requests and for further information and public statements, which we'll provide to you. When you ask your questions this afternoon, please introduce yourself and your outlet. Uh, questions can be taken in English, French, or Persian. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience. I had to recharge the batteries a little bit. Good afternoon. <laughs> I'll try to be as uh, brief as possible in my answers to give as much chance for your questions. So, shall we just, sorry. Hi. Uh, Josh Glancy from the Sunday Times. Um, thank you for your talk earlier. It was very interesting. Uh, one aspect I just wanted to push you further on is um, there's a kind of implicit assumption in your talk that this time is different, that this is a terminal moment for the regime uh, in Iran. I would be interested to know what makes you feel confident at that. You know, they are a regime that's been there several decades. They have, you know, th their instruments of power are quite sort of well entrenched in the country. What makes you confident that, that this is terminal, whether it's this year or this decade or, or whenever that might be? Well, you know, there are several factors. Number one is in the annals of history, there's a point that you reach the so-called ebullition point, And I, be I believe we are practically there right now as we speak. Um, the fact that uh, the demonstrations are far more widespread and national, on the national level. Uh, all sorts of people are involved in it, not a particular group or a particular sector of society. The common slogan is the same, regardless of whether in Kurdistan or in Baluchistan or in Azerbaijan or in Tehran. And at the end, people are chanting for the uh, end of the regime, directly calling to death to the dictator. I think that's unprecedented when you think of uh, the history of the past 40 years and the fact that uh, today we can see more and more disillusionment and peeling away from the regime by former reformists, both in the civilian cadres as well as some of the militia that are beginning to uh, 
demonstrate that. So it's just a matter of time uh, for, for it to reach its, its, its final climax. I think we're in that mode. This is like weeks or months preceding the, the, the ultimate collapse. Not dissimilar to the last three months in 1978, uh, before the revolution 40 years ago. Um, what uh, to me is also another sign of persistence, despite the repression, is that uh, some aspect of fear has dissipated among people. I'm not saying all of it, but some of it. Uh, they are daring the regime. They are, uh, unfortunately, um, risking their lives and some losing their lives. Because life under this regime would be meaningless anymore. You're talking about young people who don't want to be yet another generation being sacrificed. And you can hear it among students these days. You can hear it among uh, disenfranchised people in the, the rural areas. Uh, in short, it has become today a national cry. So all of these indicators uh, are, I think, um, elements that you can build this argument that you know this is measured really by virtue of how many people for how long are in fact doing this inside the country. Um, and what will, of course, expedite the process, which is really that factor that I was trying to allude to to some extent today, is what role does the international community have in terms of uh, giving more, putting more wind in the sails of, of the people and also deflating any hope that the regime has in clinging on to power by trying yet again a tactic of uh, stepping back and pretending like they are going to be a little bit more reasonable or what have you, which has been the old classic game of uh, you know, uh, what it has done all these years. Uh, they, are, they are running out of that option too. Um, and um, I think a, a big blow to the regime was certainly what happened uh, last week uh, with uh, the elimination of uh, uh, Soleimani because he could have been a, a, a great persona in, the, in terms of uh, is the country going to shift towards a post-Islamic uh, dictatorship of some form? and we'll have to deal with a couple of decades of some kind of a simplified dictatorship, or are we talking now about a total implosion of all the forces associated with this regime falling into the hands of the people? So that's, that's where we are. Sir. Thank you. I'm Matthew Petty from The National Interest. Um, Mr. Pahlavi, thank you for your talk. Uh, you seem to not be interested in reclaiming the throne or presenting yourself as a future king. Um, if so, why, why are you the voice of the people of Iran? If you're speaking as a private citizen rather than the heir to the peacock throne and the light of the Aryans, then why does your voice matter more than any Iranian American who is, hasn't been to Iran in 40 years? Well, that you'll have to ask the Iranian people the reason why. But as far as my motivation and concern is, I believe that my best role to play would be to be an advocate for the people. I'd like to be on this side of the fence, facing the authorities and defending the people's right so that we can establish a true democracy, rather than to be in the position of governance or, or authority, having to be accountable to the people. I think there are plenty of people out there who can play that role in the future. I don't see that as my role. But I want to be able to make sure that we can ultimately um, implement uh, a future democracy, regardless of what the final form will take. Because at the end of the day, that has always been the missing link to Iran's full uh, um, path of uh, liberalization and democratization. Uh, we have about 100 years worth of starting it back in 1906. Hopefully, we'll be able to culminate it uh, early in the 20th century. Sir. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Sean Tandon with AFP. Uh, you sub voiced support in your talk for the maximum pressure idea on the, uh, on the regime. Could you expand a little bit more on what you hope for in terms of US policy? Uh, you spoke of the support from the Trump administration, but there have also been moves, for example, the restriction of visas for Iranians, uh, President Trump's talk of destroying cultural sites. Are you comfortable entirely with the agenda of the Trump administration when it comes to Iran? Um, first of all, um in terms of what can be done in the context of international law, and I think at some point when uh, you're talking about uh, the policy of sanctions, it's uh, sanctions by the United Nations resolutions. And to that effect, it is one element of keeping pressure on these kind of regimes. Uh, every time you, you lack that pressure, the regimes benefits from it without the people benefiting from it on the other side. But having a policy of sanctions alone 
while maintaining and preserving the status quo with hope of behavior change is the reason why I've always said that this is a basic flaw in the foreign policy of Western governments since the regime's inception. Now, a lot of people wanted to entertain a possibility for reform, starting with the Iranian people themselves. It started back after the war, war when uh, Khatami came into the picture and he had promised some elements of reforms within this regime that a lot of people were hoping for the generation of that time, um, only to realize that after two years of demanding that the response to them was to crush them. That was the first wave of protest that was crushed by the regime. Later on, we saw in 2009 the same elements. Still, the dialogue in the outside world was based on there are still some moderates in the regime that we ought to entertain and sort of isolate the, uh, the, the radical forces and so on. Even as the last cycle of the so-called election in, in Iran, we had the same situation with uh, Rouhani. But today, people on the streets realize that this whole concept of expecting any meaningful reform within this regime is long uh, past. Uh, so then what? It's moving beyond the system. Can such totalitarian system with such degree of brutality be kept in check or make life more difficult for them to repress their citizens? A lot of it has to do with part of the sanction policies. But as much as pressure on the regime is important, support for the people is the other side of the equation that has yet to really materialize beyond the rhetoric of moral support in words to something more so that, if you will, that scale will tip in favor of the people. As far as the dialogue within Iran is concerned today, there's far more concentration in what's next as opposed to are we back to where we were before. I think the world in that sense is lagging a little bit behind the curve or where they need to be. And as I explained earlier today in uh, my uh, presentation, the dialogue has to now start with the forces within the country because they are going to be inheriting this implosion and be the elements that form or participate in the transition. You cannot possibly expect to have a better controlled implosion without having a direct dialogue with them. And we had an example earlier, uh, last couple of weeks, where they seem to have been, at the moment, um, a sort of resistance to having any dialogue with the forces of the opposition under these uh, guys that perhaps it will infuriate the regime that we're trying to diplomatically call back. Uh, the streets of Iran are way beyond that. Um, that's why I'm saying there has to be an adjustment of the clock to the reality of the streets in Iran and recognize that the best way to make the sacrifice that people in Iran have to endure in terms of economic hardship as a result of sanctions is worth if you will, the cost. If they see light at the end of the tunnel and as part of their deliverance, they'll tighten the belt. But if they think it's only a slap on the wrist to make sure that these people will behave nicely, uh, that, that is not going to be sellable, whether it is part of our domestic uh, discourse or whether it's part of the international message. Sir. So I'm going to ask in Persian because I'm the voice of America. کام بیست توان هستم صدای آمریکا شاهزاده رضا پهلوی دو تا سوال ازتون داشتم سوال اولم در مورد دو تا حادثه است که به اتفاق خیلی نزدیک اتفاق افتاد یکی که سپاه بود که هواپیمای مسافر بری رو زد و سرنگون کرد فکر می‌کنین عواقبش چی باشه چه پیامدی داشته باشه در همین حال میخوام نظرتون در مورد اقدام آمریکایی برای کشته شدن برای کشتن قاسم سلیمانی رو بدونم و اینکه چه عواقبی ممکنه برای سپاه داشته باشه اونجا این سال اول هم هست سال دوم میخواستم بپرسم همونجوری که شما میدونین تو گفتگوتون هم توی سخنرانیتون اشاره کردین مدت زمان اعتراضات در ایران کمتر و کمتر شده قبلا اگر فاصله چند سال یا چند ماه بود الان پیوسته‌تر نزدیک‌تر فکر می‌کنین چه اتفاقی داره میفته چه پیامدی برای چه چیزایی بعد خودمون آماده کنیم یا رو به رو بشیم باشه ممنونم البته سوال شما خیلی مرکب و مفصل هستش سعی می‌کنم خیلی کوتاه پاسخ بدم بدون شک از بین رفتن قاسم سلیمانی یک حربه بزرگی رو از سر راه مردم برداشته و در واقع یک مهره بسیار حساسی برای رژیم بود نه از من برای مردم و از این لحاظ خب خیلی درها رو برای شرایط دیگری باز میکنه به خصوص که فکر کنم هیچ شخصیتی نیست که بخواد در درون یک سیستم نظامی 
یک راه حل گزینه یا بدیلی به نظام ارائه بده در قالب یک دیکتاتور نظامی بلکه نمایندگان نیروهای انتظامی امروز میتونن راحت تر به مردم وصل بشن به خصوص اگر ببینن که حمایت اخستری از جامعه بنامیلی هست برای مردم ایران همطور که در سوال قبلیم پاسخ دادن مسئله این هواپی ما کلن یک نمونه دیگری است از عدم مدیریت این نظام سیل خوزستان رو داشتیم امروز تو بلوچستان ببینیم و از چیه این اتفاقات سبانه همش برمیگرده به کلن یک نظامی که از روز اولش کوچکترین مدیریت سازندهی برای مملکت از خودش نشون نداده و خب اینم باز گذاشت تو لیست بیکفایتی های رژیم و اما همطور که در جلسه سخنرانی اشاره شد قطعا یکی از سوالات کلیدی برای دنیا و برای مردم ایرانی این استش که خب حالا اگر رژیم سقوط کرد چه چی چیزی قرار جاشو بگیره و چگونه دقیقا اینا مطالبی است که به روز پیگیرش خیلی از ماها هستیم من جمله خود بنده در رابطه با نقش اپوزیسیون و فعالین سیاسی داخل و خارج کشور نقش مدیریت و مدیران میانه ای که باس بیان و این خلای مدیریت رو در درون کشور پر بکنن و هماهنگی این کارها نقش هدایت و رهبری حرکت های اعتراضی امروز مردم نهایتا احتمالا رسیدن به شرایط که بتوان در سرتاسر سر مملکت اعتصابات کارگری اجرا کرد که آخرین ضربه به نظام میتونه باشه و وادار کنیم این نظام رو به یک فروپاشی منطقه یه فروپاشی کنترل شده و این مهمترین بخش مسئله است اگه اگر نگرانی برای خودی یا خارجی هستش که بعد از اینا وضع چی میشه همطور که میدونید رژیم همیشه سعی کرده یه لولوی لورو، بتراشه و بگه اگه ما بریم ایران نمیدونم سوریه میشه چی میشه چی نمیشه در صورتی که اینطور نیست ایران دارای بسیار زیاد افراد متخصص کارشناس که سر به تنشون میارزه در داخل مملکت دارن که بتونن مدیریت کشور رو به بگیرن در تمام رده هاش متها دیالوگ با این نیروها تا به حال نبوده در دنیای خارجی یکی از عوامل که کمک خواهد کرد به اینکه یک سناریو تغییر کنترل شده داشته باشیم ایجاد این ارتباط و دیالوگ با این نیروها هستش و تکلیف رو برای خیلی دیگران هم روشن میکنه شما خودتون رو بذارین جای یک ارتش به جای یک فرمانده ارتش یا سپاه امروز یه ما که دیگه به این نظام باوری نداریم اکثرمون هم مثل بقیه مردم باید حتی یه شغل ثانوی داشته باشیم بعضی کافی اصلا مزد نمیگیرن از این سیستم میخوایم به مردم بس بشیم و بی به امید چی آیا آینده ای برای ما در فردای نظام هست بس مقداری از این پاسخ از خود مردم بس بگیرن مقداریش هم بس ببینن که سناریو تغییر در ایران از طریق جنگ و این اتفاقات نخواهد بود که اون وقت مجبور شن در این موضع دفاعی قرار بگیرن بلکه میتونن ریزش بیشتری داشته باشن و به مردم ملحق بشن و در از سپر بلای مردم باشن در مقابل تهمونده رژیم که میخواد با سرکوب خودش رو حفظ بکنه تا که خودشون بشن درگیر با مردم تمام اینها به هم رب داره و بنابراین این دقیقا اتفاقاتی است که تو این هفته ها و ماه های آینده باز از نزدیک دنبال بکنیم یا رصد بکنیم و اینجا میگفتم که بخش نهایی کار برمیگرده به میزان امیدواری مردم به آیندهشون این یک ملتی است که امروز نیازمند از هر چی بیشتر قوت قلب و امید هست. مقداری به پای خودشون هست، مقداری هم بستگی داره به اینکه دنیا به چه طریقی به این قضیه برخورد خواهد کرد. Briefly, uh, Stephen Kinzer, author of All the Shah's Men and the New York Times correspondent, has said that it might be better for future U.S.-Iran relations if the U.S. had a statement of understanding, not necessarily an apology, about the 1953 coup against Mohammad Mossadegh. And similarly, a future Iran regime should put out a statement about the seizure of the American hostages in 1979. Do you support joint statements like that by a future Iranian regime about the 53 coup and the 73 capture of Americans? Well, first of all, that's not my decision. It depends on who is in charge at what time to say whether or not it will be appropriate or not to make such a statement. What's important for me is that we have due process, both in terms of democratic process as well as a way to, to gauge the sentiment of the nation. Uh, these kind of elements that goes back to something that happened prior, it's a it's a national decision to be made where the people themselves had to be part of that decision. 
For instance, did America needed to apologize to the Japanese for the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as an example, or many other examples of that nature? Uh, as I said, this is not my, my place to opine on this. It's not my decision. As long as we have a process whereby uh, future governments or parliaments feel the need or not to opine on an issue or not, has to be left to that. All I know is right now we don't have an instance where people of Iran are represented by a democratic system. Therefore, we cannot gauge at the end of the day exactly what their sentiments and opinion are on any of these issues for that matter. Sir. Uh, Dave Lawler from Axios, thank you for doing this. Um, you said in your speech that you uh, see a future Iran that will be secular, democratic, and an ally of the United States. Those are three very difficult things to balance, as we've seen around uh, the region recently. I guess if you introduce a democratic system, how can you have confidence that you wouldn't have uh, parties that either have a religious basis that would be popular or anti-American sentiment be, uh, you know, win out? I guess, can you, are, can you really be confident that all three of those things you described uh, can, can be guaranteed in a future run. Yes, absolutely. First and foremost, when it comes to religion, nobody other than the non-regime clerics will be the first to tell you that the amount of damage, not just to the faith and the religious establishment, but the people's sentiments towards the faith has been as damaged than, by any other cause than the regime itself. So, if anything out of their own concern, or for that matter, for the better health of society, and as a prerequisite to democracy, and that goes for the entire planet, doesn't matter if you are in Japan or in Canada, it's a matter of freedom of religion guaranteed under a constitution, and which makes the matter a private matter to begin with, but a guarantee for anyone to have faith or even be an atheist. That, that has to be part of a guarantee of pluralism and human rights of an Iranian citizen in the future of the country. The minute you make any country dominated by a single ideology, religious or otherwise, is the beginning of discrimination. And we have 40 years of experimentation with religious governance that people of Iran today know that this is not a solution. So let me be very clear. When you advocate for separation of church and state, that doesn't mean that you're anti-religion. That simply means that religion has its place, but state and religion has to be separate from each other as a prerequisite to democracy. If the question is, do you think the Iranian people understand this today? I would say, hell yes. Okay, so the proof is in the pudding. <laughs> listen to their slogans. Listen to what they say about their sentiments against the clerical regime, which basically means that they can tell the difference between what it is that we're talking about freedom of religion, where is this that we're talking about fighting a religious dictatorship? That thing, that's, uh, I think, quite, uh, quite clear. As to their democratic aspiration, that too is something that we witness every single day. All you need to do is to monitor tremendous amount of chatter and activity in social media that will indicate to you where the people of Iran today are at in terms of their own discourse and dialogues. Forget about what the regime says. But if you listen to what the people say, there'll be ample evidence to support my conviction and my, um, how can I say, my uh, uh, trust that this is the case, that they know what they're talking about. I don't think people are going in the streets risking their lives just because they are disputing uh, uh, an electric bill. It's much more than that. And it's a right to self-determination that was their cry from day one and has yet to be achieved in Iran. Sir. Thank you. Atsutoshi Nishikawa uh, uh, with NHK, Japanese public broadcaster. I have two questions. One is that the President Trump says that he supports the people of Iran. So have you, uh, what kind of supports have you received uh, from Trump administration? And have you been closely communicating with uh, US administration officials? And the other question is that what kind of support, uh, what, what's your expectations of uh, international community, including Japan, to de-escalate the tensions between the United States and Iran. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, uh, anything that uh, you heard me say today, I've been saying it for years, not just to this administration, but to previous administrations, and not only in America, but also in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, 
well, basically what it is uh, that we expect as those of us fighting for uh, the democratic alternative and a secular democratic system vis-a-vis -vis this theocracy, that there are certain elements that goes into the support towards the people beyond just a rhetoric and, 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 and whatever has been stated, but doesn't necessarily translate to specific actions. For instance, uh, I'll give you an example earlier today. How about the creation of a uh, world-supported uh, strike fund, something that will give an incentive to somebody inside Iran going on strike that they will somehow get compensated for, for, for that. It incentivized them that, you know, we're not going to starve to death and uh, found ourselves in, in, in prison for, for protests and what have you. Uh, how about uh, bringing more sanctions on the regime by eliminating their propaganda machinery and sanctions IRB completely, for instance? What we can do in terms of more voices being heard in, towards Iran and to Iran by uh, boosting the amount of uh, programming and broadcast that goes into Iran from the free world? Examples like that. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff, but it will take too much time for me to uh, list them here today. And I'm passing this message on by various means to not only the current administrations, but the world over. Um, in terms of the escalation, again, um, if you're stuck too long on a tree, you forget about the forest. What I mean by that is the forest is this regime. This regime, at the end of the day, will not be able to do anything different than it has done for the past 40 years. Do you think it was because they had a lack of opportunity? The world was willing to bend over backwards to give them that opportunity more than 20 years ago. They rejected it. Uh, again, there were some at attempts to give them yet another uh, opportunity with the JCPOA. Again, there was a lack of transparency or no guarantee that it will actually not re resume back once uh, it runs out its, its time. All along, continuing their proxy wars in the region and many other consequences, not just to the Iranian people directly, but as I mentioned, Syria and other places. It still is part of a regime that could have spent those billions of dollars that it had on Iranian welfare and the betterment of lives in Iran rather than maintaining their proxy wars while people are starving to death in Iran today. So insisting on a path of de-escalation, the quickest way to de-escalate is to make the people in charge rather than this regime remain in charge. That's the quickest way. Why? Because this regime has sought escalation. In fact, it may be willing to risk escalation. But the reason they haven't done is not because they didn't think about it. It's because Mr. Khamenei, among others, knows exactly that he will never have the support of the Iranian people in their escalation with the war in terms of a conventional conflict because the people are not there. So rather than insist on can we still find a method or a way of communicating the escalation, by saying that, well, we are reasonable people, we're not asking for you guys to leave and we're giving you yet another opportunity. I think we're beyond that. The people on the streets are going to be soon enough represented by their true representatives. Their first desire of the Iranian people is immediate stability and peace regionally. So we can attend to a multitude of domestic problems that have been neglected for so many years. We cannot start taking care of our environment and the water crisis so long as we have a regime that calls the destruction of Israel as opposed to asking Israeli experts who are the best in the world in terms of managing water crisis, for instance. We cannot expect to have an opportunity for exercising and practicing freedom of faith if we get involved into a Sinai Shiite conflict, which started with this regime. Because before that, we didn't have this problem. Iran had good relationship with all of our Arab uh, neighbors and Muslims around the world, as well as Israel, as a matter of fact. It was not a question of religion. All of this is part of the institutional memory of the Iranian people. And the question today is, do you think that you will have a better world with a different regime in Iran, truly representative of the people, than expect yet again to have a sudden change of uh, mood or opinion by a regime that is trying to desperately hang on to power, but has lost it completely in the streets. And its only answer to people peacefully protesting is murdering them. You can no longer justify diplomacy while there's so much abhorrent repression at home, especially when people say, hey, 
we are out there fighting for our uh, freedom and lives. Where are you in all this? It has to be beyond rhetoric. Show that you actually support us. If you want us to understand and appreciate what you're trying to do with us by curtailing the regime abilities by means of sanctions, great. But if it's only that, for behavior change, you ultimately are adding insult to injury without solving the problem. You need to add that component that had been missing all these years, which means now you have to engage with the people and give them that final mm, to say, OK, the cavalry is on its way, and we are not going to be alone in this fight. Mind you, the people are fighting the fight. We are not asking any foreign government to do it for us. But we are asking them to choose sides. And as Martin Luther King once said, we shall remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. That's what the people of Iran need to hear, not silence anymore. We'll take one last question. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you. Oh, no problem. Hi there. Uh, thank you for coming in. Uh, Richie McGinnis from The Daily Caller. I was wondering if you could uh, just share your thoughts on the MEK, also known as the People's Mujahideen of Iran. Um, in any democratic process, the ultimate uh, credibility, legitimacy, or acceptance of any organization or group rests solely in the court of public opinion and compliance with due process of, of, of law and democratic participation. The judgment is left to the public. The opportunity has to be for all, and whether or not people belong or not, again, is something that uh, is, at the end of the day, a matter of compliance and uh, acceptance. It's as simple as that. Do you believe that your family should apologize for their own role in the 1953 coup? Forget America, but you have a say in your own family. I leave it to the historian to determine what it was, but usually a coup is from below to the top, not from the top to the down. That's number one. Number two, I have heard the terminology used sometimes by some saying that a democratically elected government of Mossadegh. If anybody studies the Iranian constitution of the time clearly, the prime minister was never elected. He was either appointed by the king, subject to parliament ratification, or vice versa. Suggested by parliament, accepted by the king. There was not a process of, of um, uh, if you win elections. To suggest that that one was a coup is to suggest that every single change of prime ministership in Iran must have been a coup too. If that's the case, then we had coup d'etats every other year. So think, study, understand what the Constitution at the time was. And that's as much as I have to say on the subject. But I'll tell you one last thing apart from that, because probably there would be impossible to achieve any consensus on this subject, uh, if not forever, for a long time. But I have a constructive suggestion to my fellow compatriots. And that is that, first of all, it would have been impossible to say that whether it was my father or Prime Minister Mossadegh, that they were both right or both wrong. But the question is, what would have been the determining mechanism to say whether it was constitutional or not? A little bit like you have here with the Supreme Court, whether an act of the executive or anybody else is constitutional or not, therefore avoiding constitutional crisis. We did not have at the time any apparatus that could have said, oh, the farman of the king was against the law, or vice versa, the refusal to be set aside by, by, by the prime minister was against uh, the law. What entity was supposed to step in and make that determination? What if the orders carried out by military officers whether it was following the order of the king or the prime minister, would be spared court martial or a threat of it by going against the, the, the such order should that order have been illegal, for instance. What I'm trying to say here is that the lesson we should learn for the future is to have mechanism and instances that can intervene should there be any kind of constitutional crisis as such. 
it could be something similar to what the Supreme Court here is, completely separate in the checks and balance system from the legislation and executive. It could be an element that the French have, for instance, Conseil Constitutionnel, which is yet another apparatus to foresee all that. That ought to be what we need to implement towards the future. Because at the end of the day, no matter what our opinion was on what happened 70 years ago, is not going to alter the fact that we need to have safeguards for the future to prevent some issues to uh, happen, regardless of what side of the argument we're on. And that's why I think part of what needs to be considered by the Constituent Assembly as they work on the next Constitution is to also anticipate these safeguards and build teams mechanisms that will provide the nation with yet another layer of protection to make sure that no one deviates from the law, that no one is above the law, another simple act committed can create a crisis that has been so disruptive in the progress of a nation. That should be our lesson learned. So rather than opining on what happened, I'm proposing a mechanism to bring more safeguards towards the future. And I hope that those who have to work on this as experts, constitutional uh, lawyers and what have you, will really think about this and understand that uh, one of the reasons why democracies survive is that power is not concentrated in any branch whatsoever. At least that's what we've learned across the planet so far. And that there is beyond, by the way, beyond just the structure of state and governance, additional protection. Labor unions, free press, all other mechanisms that people can use. So whistleblowers or watchdogs are not muzzled because if somebody's trying to brush it under the rug and hide it, as the saying goes, you can fool some of the people all the time, most of the people, most of the time, uh, some of the time, but you cannot fool all of the people all of the time. And at the end, it becomes access to truth and fact. And again, part of this is media. So choose what you cover and how you cover it to see whether or not we can come with a solution rather than to simply tease arguments that have been divisive and not constructive towards a better future that all Iranians can benefit for, even if they disagreed on something that happened before. I think it's important that we agree on what we need to do for our future for the sake of all and not just some of a group versus the other. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. If you, have any, if you have any clarifying questions or requests, we will not be accommodating any requests for one-on-one -on -one interviews today. You can reach out to media at rezapahlavi.org for comments, clarifications, questions, or further requests. None will be accommodated today. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate it.